This is the Oxford MAT, also known as the Maths Admissions Test. I am a British uni student and I will be going into my third year in September. Now this is an exam you would do at the end of your A-levels in order to apply to somewhere like Oxford, Cambridge or other top universities in the UK. Now I've never taken this exam and I haven't really looked at the past papers, but you would hope going into third year that I'd be able to do pretty well on it. But there's only one way to find out. We're allowed two and a half hours and there are a total of seven questions. However, depending on what course you're looking to do, you only do five of them. Now, because I do maths, I'm going to be doing the questions related to maths, believe it or not. And this is going to be questions one, two, three, four, and five. Without wasting any more time, let's get started. Now, question number one, how many real solutions are there to this equation? Now, some of you doing GCSE or maybe early to A level may not have seen this symbol before where the X is in between two lines. So as you can see in the hint just down here, even if X is say minus three, the two lines basically mean that you just take the number value rather than being positive or negative. So it's just three. So when we have a question like this, we have to consider both the positive and the negative cases for X. Question one has 10 separate questions within it. So rather than me sitting here and talking through all of them, I'm just going to show you a time lapse of me doing some of them and I'll flash all the questions up on the screen so that you can pause them and have a go for yourself as well. Hold me close till I get up Time is barely on our side I don't want to waste what's left the storms we chase are leading us, and love is all we'll ever trust, yeah. Right, it has been about an hour, and I've just about finished off all the questions within question one. Before we move on to the rest of the questions, which are slightly longer, let's see how I got on with those questions. I must admit there are a few in there that I'm not very confident on, so it'll be interesting to see what the answer really is. No, I don't want to waste what's left. Honestly, 7 out of 10, I'm quite happy with that. There are certain questions in there that if you've done A-levels recently, you're probably quite familiar with them. Some of the topics I haven't really looked at much recently. However, there are a few questions I want to quickly talk about because I quite like them. Question 1B, I haven't really seen a question like this before. I know my diagrams are a bit messy because I was doing it in like exam mode. Where we've got C1 and C2, I've drawn a tangent and tried to imagine what they're trying to describe in the question. And as you can see, between the radii and the tangents, we actually get a right angle triangle. And by doing Pythagoras on this, we get the radius of the outermost circle. And after doing this a few times, I started to notice a pattern. For example, C1 had a radius of 1, C2 had a radius of root 2, C3 had a radius of root 3. And when I spotted this, I went back to C1 and realised that 1 is the same as root 1. So assuming this was the same all the way up, C100 is going to have a radius of root 100, which is 10, which led me to my answer of D. The other question was 1F. As you can see, it's a pretty difficult looking question. With a bit of substitution, if we let sine of theta equal sine 72, then sine of 5 theta is going to be almost like sine of 360 and using the sine graphs we know what sine 360 is we know that it is zero so ultimately we can set up like a quintic equation and as you can see that i've written 16x to the 5 minus 20x cubed plus 5x is equal to zero now i'm aware you could have solved this with brute force and trying different factors until you got something that worked but to be honest i looked at the answers and using the sine graph I know that sine 72 is positive, and I know that it's roughly between half and one. Now, three of those answers straight away are either zero or negative, and I know they're not going to be that one. And then I looked at the last two and converted the roots into decimals and got a rough idea as fractions of what they'd be. I knew it wouldn't be D, because 2.8 over 8 is less than half, so I thought, by logic, it must be A. Now, I understand I would have got most of the marks for this because I did do the whole substitution method and got it down to a quintic equation. I just didn't solve it. So let me know down below, what would your method have been? The main reason I wanted to bring this one up is because it just goes to show, even if you feel like you aren't really getting anywhere with one process, just by looking at the question in a slightly different way can be a really useful way to answer the question correctly. 
After marking the first part, I was interested to see roughly what kind of percentage I need to somewhat be successful towards an Oxford application here. And it was a lot higher than I was hoping for. It says the average score for people who got shortlisted onto like the next part of the application on average got 75.2. So that means in questions two, three, four, and five, I need to get more towards the end of 80% to be considered on the shortlist. So let's hope the rest of the questions can go a little bit better than how question one went. So I've just about come up to the full two and a half hours that I'm allowed for the exam. And I've got pretty much as far as I could have with questions two, three, four, and five. So I'm just gonna quickly mark them and then we will see what my final result is and would I have got into Oxford having already completed two years of university. Just like with some of the questions within question one, I just wanna mention a couple things about questions four and five that I thought might be useful for those of you watching, going into your A-levels or maybe going off to uni. Now question four I, you will encounter problems like this as you progress to the higher levels of A-level maths. And that involves drawing graphs that you're maybe not very familiar with. It is very simple to do. All you have to do is just think of different values of x, substitute them in, and you will get the coordinates for them, just like the stuff you've done at GCSEs with the tables. So by doing that, as you can see, I've managed to create the graph for 4i. I was also required to do the turning point, which requires a bit of differentiation and then solving the equations. Those of you that have just finished your GCSEs, you will learn that at A level. And also question 4ii, a very, very difficult GCSE style question. It involves function transformations, but you have to spot the transformation yourself. So as you can see, I've experimented by substituting in different values in place of the x. So I started off with 4x plus 1. It is immediate that that is what they substituted in underneath the square root. And then from there, I just had to take away a final three quarters to get the minus a quarter down to minus 1. And then f of 4x plus 1 minus 3 quarters translates straight into the transformation I've described in the blue writing just down here. And the other thing I wanted to mention was on question 5, everybody that does maths knows that a long wordy question is never fun to deal with. However, this one, once you break it down into simple steps, is actually quite nice. So all that's going on for those of you that can't be bothered to read it or you don't really understand it, is you're choosing a door. And then when that door is opened, the item once shut again is swapped with either of the doors to the left of it or the right of it immediately. And a lot of the questions follow the same kind of pattern in that it's up to you to problem solve different ways that the person playing the game can maximise the amount of prizes they get. And I just thought it was quite interesting the way that it can be optimised just using some basic maths to guarantee nearly the full amount of prizes possible. But moving away from that, what you're all actually interested in is the result I got. Have I got into Oxford University? Now, after counting up all of the results from two, three, four, and five, each of those questions was out of 15. On question two, I got 11. On question three, I got 12. So starting off really well. Question four, I only got seven out of 15. And question five, I got nine out of 15. Now. If you remember from question one, I got seven out of 10, and each of those seven was worth four marks. So that corresponds to 28 marks out of 40. So all in all, I've got 67 marks out of 100. Now, 67 out of 100 would have been right on the edge of getting shortlisted or not. So I'll leave it up to you guys to decide, do you think I would have been given an interview and taken onto the next stage based off these results? Now, I do think with a bit of revision over some of the harder A-level topics. I may have been able to pick up a few more marks, so may have been able to secure my place a bit better. But at the end of the day, 67 out of 100, I'm quite happy with it. Let me know how you guys did down below. And if any of you are thinking about applying to Oxford or Cambridge, if you need any tips, I will try my best to help you out.